What up, what up, what up? Welcome back to Sam Dunks, the weekly NBA show over at Slab Stocks. I'm your host, Sam. Please follow us on Instagram at Slab Stocks. Subscribe to us on YouTube and also subscribe to our newsletter, which you can find at the top of the page on slabstocks.com. Today, we are finishing up our coverage of the 2018 NBA draft. Uh, we're picking up with pick 14 today, covering a number of different players. Uh, there's a ton of guys I generally like in this draft and some that I'm not going to be covering simply because I don't have the time to do it. And I don't think that pushing this series to four weeks makes a ton of sense. Uh, so I will be doing my best to cover the most interesting remaining players. But please understand there are other players in this draft that I like as actual NBA players that I just don't have time to cover today, and I apologize for that. All right, so first up for today, I mentioned him last week, with the 14th pick to the Denver Nuggets, Michael Porter Jr. Someone asked me last week on Instagram how many times I said SGA's name in the video, and I said, and they said that the man crush was surreal, and I counted, it was 10 times, uh, and you know what? They're just some guys that I naturally gravitate towards and some guys that I naturally gravitate away from. I think that just is what comes with fandom, and I admit that sometimes it's hard for me to be totally objective with certain players. So JJJ is one of my guys, Shea is obviously another, and Michael Porter Jr. is another one of those guys that I just really like as a fan. So understand that I do really like him, I like what he brings, and if you want to take everything I say with a grain of salt, uh, I understand, that's perfectly fine. These are all just my opinions. Some guys I'm a little higher on, and maybe I'm a little biased. There are more question marks with Michael Porter than with the other two guys I mentioned. You know, if you weren't paying attention a few years back, this is important information to know. Michael Porter Jr. was pretty much universally a top two recruit in his college recruiting class. Uh, he was right up there with Bagley and Aiton, Bamba, JJJ, Colin Sexton, all those different guys. And all the early projections were that he was going to be a very high draft pick in the 2018 NBA draft. A lot of projections even had him as the number one overall pick. But he played through a lot of nagging back pain throughout high school. He had to see chiropractors pretty regularly, miss some time. He went to Mizzou. Um, according to him, once he got there, before the season even started, some of the therapists that he was working with, one of them actually made his injury quite a bit worse, and suddenly he said he couldn't even jump very well. Uh, once he got out there, he played only two minutes against Iowa State. Then he was injured. He had to go have a, a surgery on his back. Um, he had a couple slipped discs or herniated discs. Um, then he came back, played two games at the end of the season, but that's all we saw from him was three games in his college career, pretty much just two. So there's a lot of question marks about his health. They caused him to fall to the Nuggets at 14, and you know the Nuggets, they were tailor-made to pick this guy. You know, deep roster, they could afford to roll the dice on a guy that they might not be able to see, see for a year, um, but for whom the payoff could be huge. So they selected him, they went and sent him to go have his second spinal surgery. He recovered from that. Then he twisted his knee, he sprained his knee, he's had some ankle problems. Uh, so investing in Michael Porter Jr. is not a guarantee. You know, Injuries are unpredictable, but some guys are just kind of predisposed to getting injured, and I think MPJ kind of fits in that category. I think the Nuggets do have a good training staff. They've done a good job with him so far. Hopefully they can keep him healthy, because if he can stay healthy, uh, I think he's going to be a really special player. He only played in 48 games this year, uh, just one start, only averaged 14 minutes per game. So not a whole ton to work with, um, but per 36 minutes, so we have to do some extrapolation to make, you know, to see what he was wor what he was playing like. Take these things with a grain of salt, but thir per 36 minutes, 19 points, 11 rebounds, 2 assists, a steal and a block, shot 42% from 3, um, shot over 40% both on catch and shoot and pull-ups from three. So really good shooting from all around. 64% from the restricted area last season, which is quite good as well. Uh, just really not too many weaknesses for Michael Porter when it comes to actually shooting the basketball. There are a lot of other things that he doesn't do very well. He's not much of a distributor, doesn't get to the line very much. He can block shots, but he really doesn't play much defense at all. Uh, he is a negative on that end of the court. Uh, like bottom 100 defenders in the league or so on based on some metrics. You know, I rag on a lot of guys for that exact type of stuff. So this is going to sound super hypocritical. But while there are still negatives for him, that would be great for him to iron out. Also, it really doesn't matter much when you're playing on the Denver Nuggets. Uh, he doesn't need to distribute the ball very much because he is playing next to the best passing big man in basketball and Nikola Jokic. Also, his defense isn't as detrimental to the team since the Nuggets are a very good defensive team. 
you know, I brought up the defense as a big concern for Trey Young and Colin Sexton and some others simply because they're not in very good situations where those things really show up in the win column and, you know, where their negatives are really exposed quite a bit more. But guys like Doncic and MPJ, they're bad defenders too, but they're on better teams and they're afforded a lot more protection in those weaker areas. You know, so much of NBA development depends on being in the right situation. You know, there have been tons of guys that just get drafted to the wrong team and then don't have much of a career to show for it, probably because of where they started out their career. So Michael Porter Jr., he gets drafted to a Nuggets team that really has a lot of good depth. It has the top-end star in Nikola Jokic. It's got other good young players, you know, like Jamal Murray. They just don't have that offensive scorer that's going to carry the brunt of the scoring night in and night out. But I think that missing piece could be Porter Jr. So if he can actually start playing 30 minutes next year, if his usage bumps up from the 22% it was this year to 25 or 26, like I think it eventually should, he's probably a 25-point-per-game scorer. And for him in this current situation, that's all he really needs to do to get all the attention to start driving up his prices. Now, he does still have Mike Malone as a coach. Uh, Mike Malone really does like playing those tough-nosed defensive players, and, and you know, that's why he wasn't spoon-feeding minutes to Porter this past season. So it's not a guarantee that he just starts getting those minutes this coming season for some of the same reasons we've already brought up. Also, we have Jokic and his pairing to consider. Jokic isn't a very good defender, so a front line with Jokic and Porter as you know t standing next to each other Probably one of the worst defensive front courts in basketball, but could also be one of the best offensive front courts, and that'll probably lead to a number of 50 win seasons if they're still together. So lots of question marks around Michael Porter Jr. There's no guarantee that he has a long NBA career due to the injury concerns, but if he can get on the court and stay moderately healthy, I think the ceiling's actually pretty high, and there's a lot to like about his team situation moving forward. It's PSA 10 Prism Silver's rookie cards are auctioning off in the $200 range. Uh, some lower, some higher. Uh, generally right around $200, though. Uh, there's more risk involved in him than we'd like, but if you understand those risks, and if you have some disposable income that you can put at risk yourself, I think it's a buy. Um, but this next season is going to be a really big one for him. This next offseason is going to be really telling as well, since Paul Millsap is a free agent, and his departure could mean more minutes for a reporter. But if he's re-signed, Millsap's going to be cutting into Porter's minutes pretty significantly. So lots of risks to be aware of all over the place. But in general, I like Porter Jr. a lot. I have him down as a buy. You know, I think the potential is too great for him to not see those minutes and that usage moving forward. All right, moving on. I can't cover every player today since I am trying to cover the rest of the draft. So there's a guy like you know, Troy Bound Jr., who I think shows that he could be a solid enough role player moving forward. Also hasn't been given a whole ton of opportunity by Scott Brooks. And the advanced metrics, they're not really sold on him as a player and also plays on a pretty messy Wizards team that even Wizards fan loves to hate. So, you know, I think the card upside is pretty limited and really not worth, worth spending much time on, even though I like him as a player. Uh, Zaire Smith, I already talked about him in passing last week, and there just isn't much to talk about since he's hardly played so far in his career. So that brings us to one of my favorite players for the Milwaukee Bucks, pick number 17, the Michael Jordan of Delaware, Dante DiVincenzo, the big ragu. You probably remember him from Villanova in that championship run in 2018. In the tournament, he was really one of the hot names. Shot 50% from deep during that run. Poured in 31 points in the national championship game against Michigan. Uh, a lot of concern from Bucks fans that he was overdrafted off of the hype of that tournament run. And that his ceiling was actually pretty limited. But he has impressed this year. And he's quickly become one of the fan favorites in Milwaukee. His one big negative right now is that he's not been a very good shooter from deep. Just 34% from three this past season on four attempts per game, which not very good, obviously. He was quite a bit better on catch-and-shoot threes. The pull-up attempts really dragged down his overall percentage quite a bit. We would like to see him get better from there. Uh, nothing about the basic stats that stand out all that much. Nine points, five rebounds, two assists, a steal and a half. But that was on only 23 minutes per game. Per 36 minutes... Uh, so we got to stretch those out a little bit. 15 points, 8 rebounds, 4 assists, 2 steals. I do think that starting next season, DiVincenzo is going to be the starting shooting guard for the Milwaukee Bucks. I would think around 29 to 30 minutes is what we're going to be seeing from him per game, which is what Milwaukee Bucks starters generally average. 
that would be good for the Bucks, as he has been a big net positive all season. Uh, very good defensively, also good offensively, although he certainly has room for improvement there. Uh, he was the second ranked player in the NBA in net rating, right behind Giannis. Uh, a lot of that has to do with playing next to Giannis, but you know they do play exceptionally well together. Also, almost every single lineup that DiVincenzo was in was a positive in his minutes on the court. Uh, the Bucks were much better both offensively and defensively when he was playing. Uh, he carried an impressive 112 points per 100 possessions offensively uh, deep when DiVincenzo was on the court and an absolutely stifling 98 points per 100 per pos possessions defensively when the Big Regu was playing. Even though DiVincenzo will probably never shoulder much of an offensive load, you know, he does so many other things around the court. Uh, he's become really important to this Bucks team. You know, when you watch the Bucks play, and I've watched almost all their games this past year, well, for a number of years, but especially this past year, uh, and Dante, he's just one of those guys that you just can't help but notice. He's in on almost every single play. He's got the type of eye-popping athleticism that really stands out from the crowd. Uh, tons of steals. He leads to a lot of fun transition stuff. So obviously, I like him a lot, although I am a big Bucks fan, so you just got to take that into account. If he can keep improving from three-point range, he's really going to be a fun player for a long time, and a good one too, and I think he will be starting again uh, as soon as next season. You know, a lot of his value will be dependent on continuing to play alongside Giannis for the next several years, so hopefully that continues. Uh, obviously, all Bucks fans are hoping for that. Hard to say what his current prices are, you know, just not a whole ton of auctions to go off of. Uh, only has a population of 125 PSA 10 Prism Silver Rookie cards out in circulation, which, ex which would explain some of that. Uh, one auction sold on PWCC for 127. There's a lot of three on eBay for 430. Then kind of a smorgasbord of cards that went for 270 a couple weeks ago. So I don't really know what the market rate is, but in general, I like him and I have him as a buy. You, you know, probably best way to go is to buy some raw silvers, get them graded through clay cards. Uh, that'll get you the best bang for your bucks, since clearly most of DiVincenzo's silvers in circulation are ungraded. With the next pick, going 18th to the Spurs, Lonnie Walker. Pretty hard to project this guy at the moment. He only played 120 minutes his rookie season and only played 14 minutes a night last season. Uh, a lot of that is because he does play for Greg Popovich, who isn't necessarily interested in playing young players just due to their potential. Uh, there is a ton of optimism around Spurs Nation, and that's entirely based upon his athleticism, uh, which admittedly is excellent. Uh, he's very inconsistent so far. He clearly doesn't know what to do when he gets the ball in his hands, uh, which can improve with time, and we'll just have to wait and see what happens and hope that he gets that time. You know, DeMar DeRozan does have a player option for this coming season, which he reportedly will opt out of if he can't reach an agreement on an extension with the Spurs. I don't think the Spurs should be all that interested in extending DeRozan, so if he really walks, uh, that should hypothetically open up quite a few minutes for Walker somewhere on the wing, you know, splitting time between the two and the three. We'll see what happens there. Um, on court production, he shot over 40% from three, but, you know, not very efficient from really anywhere else. Per 36 minutes, he scored 14 points, four rebounds, two assists, a steal and a half, which all looks fine. Uh, but, of course, that is expanded from the 14 minutes a game that he actually produced. You know, didn't finish very well at the rim. Uh, generally just kind of looks pretty lost out there. You know, I wouldn't rule him out as an NBA player. He certainly has a ton of potential due to the athleticism alone. But honestly, you know, from what we've seen so far, he just doesn't seem like he has a very high basketball IQ. You know, he can get tunnel vision pretty badly when he's playing defense. He doesn't help out very much at all. On offense, he just doesn't seem to know what to do when he has the ball in his hands and can sometimes just kind of drop it on his way to the rim. Uh, he just disappears on offense for quite some stretches. Um, you know, So he could learn some of those things. He could be really good. He could also be really bad. There's just a huge range of possibilities and a ton of risks involved. Um, if he never figures those things out, we shouldn't be expecting Popovich to just be handing out minutes to him either. Uh, his PSA 10 Prism Silver Rookie cards have been auctioning off around $100, usually somewhere in the upper 90s. I don't think of him as a buy since, you know, I think there's probably a better chance than not that he doesn't turn into much of anything. You know, there's every year there's a ton of these high athleticism projects, and more often than not, they just don't pan out to being much. Uh, so I'm not super comfortable recommending you to potentially throw away $100 on his cards. 
But also, I wouldn't be surprised if after DeRozan leaves that all of a sudden the hype really starts building around Lonnie Rock Walker and drives his prices up for the short term. In fact, I kind of expect that to happen. I'm just not a huge long-term believer. You know, he's just got to show us something first before I can recommend him to you. So I'd probably be passing on him at this point. Uh, maybe even sell if you have him. This episode of Sam Dunks has been brought to you by Daddy Issues with Joe Buck and Oliver Hudson. It's a new podcast that has soared to the top of the iTunes sports podcast charts. Uh, just an unfiltered conversation giving us an honest look at what it's like to navigate the world of today. Explore a wide range of topics from raising kids and parenting to work-life balance to sports, hobbies, marriage, and much more. Each week they're joined by a friend, usually one that you would know. It featured guest appearances by Alex Rodriguez, Bill Simmons, David Spade, Joel McHale. Uh, the most recent episode features Andy Cohen, whom you'd probably recognize from TV. It was a funny interview, covered a wide range of issues. I didn't realize that Andy Cohen actually got coronavirus, so they covered that quite a bit. And it was interesting to get that insider perspective on the virus. Uh, so go check the podcast out. Uh, click the link in our YouTube description just to let them know that we sent you there. All right, next up, really got to start going quicker here because some of these guys, and so some of these guys are going to be pretty rapid fire. Uh, Kevin Horter to the Atlanta Hawks. I like Horter. I think he's going to be a solid role player in the league for a while. Uh, shooting overall was pretty rough this past year. Only shot 41% from the field, uh, but good from long range. 38% on six three-point attempts per game this past season. You know, the Hawks were quite a bit better offensively when Herder was on the court, which is clearly good. Defensively, he's a work in progress like a lot of the other young Hawks players. Uh, overall, this past year, he went for 12 points, 4 rebounds, 4 assists, and a steal, which is all fairly nice. I wouldn't be surprised if he became a 15-point, 5-rebound, five 5-assist five type of player, which is obviously a valuable player on pretty much any team, especially for this Hawks team. Uh, so I like him as an NBA player. I like him as a fantasy player. If you're into that sort of thing, I do play fantasy basketball. My main concern with Horder is, you know, I think there are just too many other young guys on the Hawks roster that people are much more excited about. You know, Trey Young, John Collins, Cam Reddish, DeAndre Hunter, all of whom are a lot more popular names on the card market than Kevin Horder is, and you see that in Horder's prices. As PSA 10 Prism Silver Rookie cards are auctioning only around $45 lately. Um, and But I just don't know that he'll ever become much more than a solid rotation piece. And, you know, that's just not going to drive up the prices. There's a lot more young, exciting prospects around the roster, all of whom are, you know, more captivating for most people. And I think Werder's overlooked, and he's probably just going to continue to be overlooked. So even though I like him as a player... I just don't think the potential return is great enough to recommend him as an, an investment, even at his low prices. So I guess he's a hold, you know, maybe a sell, whatever you want to do. I just don't think he's, he's much of an, uh, an exciting buy. Um, I like him, but I just don't think he'll ever garner that much attention. All right, we've got to jump around a little bit now. Jumping down to pick number 24, Anthony Simons of the Portland Trailblazers. Uh, really was disappointing this season, especially because of the hype train from last offseason that really drove up his prices. Last October and November, his PSA 10 Prism Silver Rookie cards were auctioning off consistently around 110 to 120 bucks. Nowadays, it's quite a bit lower in the $70 range. The drop was due to his poor performance. He only played 21 minutes per game, 9 points, 2 rebounds, steal and a half, only shot 34% from 3 and um, uh, from three on three and a half attempts per game. Uh, is still super young. Uh, he only turns 21 next week. Didn't even attend college. Instead, he played a postgraduate year just down the road from me in Bradenton, Florida for IMG Academy. Uh, so still a ton of development for the young fella. Uh, he is limited, though, by the roster construction in Portland. You know, the two most important players on the roster are obviously Damian Lillard and CJ McCollum. Simons is very undersized for his position. He's only six foot three, just like CJ. Uh, also pretty bad defensively, so playing him next to McCollum, it's just not a very good option. The most used lineup featuring Lillard, McCollum, and Simons, they posted a net rating of minus 17. Uh, so a lot of Simons' future value seems like it's going to be dependent on McCollum getting traded, and I just don't know if that's going to happen. He's owed $100 million over the next three seasons, and there's going to be quite a big squeeze on the cap for the next few years due to all this coronavirus stuff, and I'm not sure how many teams are going to be able to squeeze McCollum onto the payroll, especially since he's 
probably getting paid a bit above his weight class. So if Simons is going to be stuck behind Dame and McCollum for the next couple of years, I uh, just don't really see a very easy path forward for him. That said, he does have a ton of potential. He's got super athleticism, uh, supposedly should be able to shoot well eventually, and he's still super young. Uh, he was mostly bad last season, but he did show flashes throughout the year that you know were really impressive and gave you a glimpse of what he could possibly be. Uh, the Trailblazers seem to love his potential, so they're certainly going to be giving him every shot to make it. Uh, but at this point, you know, all we have to do is you know, dream on his potential. You know, there's, he's just another guy with a wide range of outcomes. Uh, certainly could become a special player. Also could just hit a wall and kind of stink. Uh, so I don't think I'm buying at the $70 right now. Probably just hold and hope for the best. I do think he's in a good place to learn. He's got Damon CJ ahead of him, which should be great mentors. So it could work out, but it's just pretty risky to me. Next up at pick number 27, Robert Williams, the Time Lord. Uh, you might have noticed I just skipped Mo Wagner and Landry Shamet, and I do like them as players. I just think their upside on the card market is limited enough that it's not worth the time today. I wish I could, but I just can't. Uh, so back to Robert Williams. I think the Celtics want him to become their starting center eventually. This past season, he only scored four points, had five rebounds, 1.2 blocks, but that was only in 14 minutes per night. Per 36 minutes, that's 11 points, 12 rebounds, and three blocks, which if he could do that, that would be really nice. Now, he's had a hard time staying on the court. You know, Injuries have hurt his development quite a bit. He only played in 23 games this past year, only in 32 games his rookie season. You know, so he just hasn't had a whole ton of time to develop yet. If he keeps getting injured, obviously that's going to continue. Uh, but he does have a pretty nice ceiling. And you know, with him, it's all about potential. And of course, potential is a double-edged sword. I don't know if he's ever going to reach his ceiling, but it is a pretty nice ceiling. If the Celtics build toward him being their starting center in the next you know, two to three years, I think there's some upside here simply because he's playing for the Celtics. And Celtics fans really like to hype up their own players, and it's a large fan base. His PSA 10 Prism Silvers are currently going for just 25 bucks, and that seems like a decent enough pure lottery ticket to me. You know, if it starts climbing towards $50, I probably wouldn't be buying still because it is kind of a flip of the coin. You know, but I think of what he could possibly bring to a Celtics team that is popular and should continue to be good. I think $25, it's worth it for a chance to just see what happens. I would put a buy on him at that low price. Uh, two more blokes out there that I'd like to talk about. First of all, Devontae Graham of the Charlotte Hornets. Uh, we all know what happened with him this past off or this past season. You know, he started the season super hot. First two games of the year, he combined for 12 threes. Um, absolutely just tore it up on a, a couple of occasions over the first couple weeks of the season. At the time, his raw Prism Silver rookie cards jumped about 600%. We had a post on it on uh, Slab Sox Instagram. It was going for around $30 at the end of the December. His PSA 10 Prism Silver rookie cards had been hovering around $100 for April and half of May, although they jumped up $130 on a few different auctions this past week. Not sure what happened there, just reporting that it did happen. Um, you know, I think what happened this past year was that the hype built early, and in general, his reputation after October kind of outstripped his production quite a bit moving forward, but I still do like what he did the rest of the season. He was just launching threes this year, over nine attempts per game, hit 37% of them, which is really good. Uh, he scored 18 points per game along with seven and a half assists, which is all just really good for a first-year starter. Uh, shooting overall, really, really bad. Just 38% from the field, which is atrocious. He's got to pick that up. Uh, but even still, with the all-time bad shooting, he was really good overall. By net rating, he was a plus 7.1, which is really good, especially when you consider that the most used Hornets lineup that featured uh, also featured Miles Bridges, his negative 8.2 net rating, Terry Rozier in his minus 7.8, and Cody Zeller with his minus 2.9. For Devontae Graham to play as much as he did around those guys and still to come out as a total big net positive, that's really impressive. And moving forward, again, he's got to improve his shooting. Uh, he's got to get better from the rest of the field. But there is a lot to like about him. You know, the three-point shooting, the passing, the free throw shooting, those are all good things. Unless he can get more efficient, I don't know that he's ever going to be a good starting guard on a good team. You know, he's a good starting guard on a bad team. I think he's a good sixth man on a good team. Um, if he jumps up in efficiency this, this coming season, I think the ceiling is increased, but we really needed him to get a little bit better. 
at the hundred dollars to 130 whatever he is um, I'm kind of having a difficult time deciding what to recommend and he's the type of deep deep range highlights that really get a lot of attention he's clearly the best player on his team which helps his value uh, so I don't think I'm going to take a position on him today. I just let you decide based on all that information. You know, another year, we're going to have a lot clearer picture of what he is, but you know, also another year might be too late to be buying. So I will just let you decide. And then the last guy I'm going to talk about today is Mitchell Robinson of the New York Knicks. I really like Mitch Rob. Uh, he's just been a victim of absolutely negligent coaching to this point. You know, first he had Fizdale just absolutely jerking around the lineup with no plan whatsoever for a season and a half. Uh, finally, you know, Fizdale was fired after basically deciding he wasn't going to play Robinson. Uh, Mike Miller stepped in. He really also didn't know how to handle the team at all, much less Mitch Rob. Uh, so the big problem for him, besides coaching, was that the Knicks went out and signed about 17 guys last offseason whose best position was probably center. Um, and there's a ton of pressure on the, the coaches to play those guys to try and make the front office look smart and hopefully to trade those guys. It just didn't work out like that. Uh, but still, the damage was done for Mitchell Robinson. Averaged only 23 minutes per game this past season. Uh, one of the big reasons why he's historically gotten not much playing time has been due to the fouls. So his rookie season, he averaged 5.7 fouls per 36 minutes, which basically just means he was on pace to foul out pretty much every single game. That was down to 4.9 fouls per 36 minutes this year. Over the last 10 games of the season, when he was averaging 26 minutes a night, that was down to 3.5 fouls per 36 minutes. Now, even if he does accumulate 5 fouls per game, that's not enough to keep him off the floor, especially because he was easily one of the best players in the Knicks this past season. He led the team in net rating by a wide margin. He led the team in PIPM by a wide margin, which is a catch-all impact measurement. He also led the team in win shares by a huge margin and VORP value over replacement player. Um, so there's no reason for him to not be playing. He's been very good defensively, and he does enough offensively to be getting 26 to 30 minutes a night. Hopefully the Knicks roster clears up a bit. Hopefully they get a coach in there that recognizes that the best young prospect on the team isn't R.J. Barrett. It's probably Mitchell Robinson. His PSA 10 Prism Silver rookie cards have been auctioning off in the $100 range recently. Some as high as $112, some as low as $88 over the past couple of weeks. I think he's a buy, first because I like him as a player. And I think he's been merely misused and still has a tremendous ceiling. Second, because he plays for New York. And with the New York media machine, you know, once they latch onto him as a franchise player, we're really going to see his cards start to climb. If the Knicks hire Tom Thibodeau, which is the current rumor, and he comes in, he starts talking up Mitch Robb because of the defensive uh, ability, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see these cards climb quite a bit in a hurry. So I am putting a buy on him. I think there's pretty clearly a lot of upside there. All right, there were a lot more guys that I do like a lot that I didn't cover. Josh Okoge, Aaron Holiday, Landry Schmidt, Mo Wagner, Roddy and you know, it's just a few of the names. So I apologize if I missed anyone. I just couldn't get to them all. Um, but that is all the time I have for today. So thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Hi, I'm Oliver Hudson. And I'm Joe Buck. And we are doing a new podcast together. It's called Daddy Issues. It's two guys with daddy issues talking about weekly topics and, and what's going on in their lives as dads, sons, brothers, as two, right. you know, adult males making their way through a coronavirus. <laughs> Click on the link in the show description or subscribe in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts.